Welcome back. Let's start by recalling that Pasteur's solution for laminar flow in a cylindrical tube under a pressure gradient delta P gives rise to a parabolic flow profile. A is the radius of the cylinder, mu is the viscosity of the fluid. And integrating that parabolic flow profile for a length of L gives rise to the hagen poisseur law for the flow q dot as a function of the pressure gradient delta p over l being q dot equals pi a to the fourth over eight mu delta p over l. So the ratio of the pressure gradient delta p to the flow q analogously to a voltage drop in a current is a resistance which is 8 mu L over pi A to the fourth. And you can see that this includes both the property of the fluid mu and the structure of the vessel. Factoring out the viscosity to leave just the geometric quantities, we get 8 L over pi A to the fourth. And this is called the geometric hindrance, being the geometric determinants of the flow resistance. The most important thing to know about the flow resistance of a Newtonian fluid in a circular tube is that the resistance varies inversely as the fourth power of the radius of the vessel. So if, for example, the radius is halved, then the resistance would increase by a factor of 16. So there's a very high dependence of resistance on radius and a large increase as the radius decreases. Now looking even just along the aorta, you can see that the diameter of the aorta uh, here shown for a dog uh, decreases substantially from the top of the aortic arch down to the uh, iliac branch. Uh, each time there's a branching vessel, the aortic uh, diameter decreases. And so as a consequence, going down the aorta, there's a significant increase in flow resistance. Continuing down the vascular tree, the vessels continue to get smaller, and consequently, the pressure drop is greater. And the portion of the arterial tree where the pressure drop is greatest is the arterioles, which are about 100 microns in diameter in the hamster cheek pouch, down to about 10 microns in diameter. And these are called the resistance vessels. They are so called not only because this is the site of the greatest pressure drop, but also because these vessels are most able to control the pressure drop by varying their diameter, because these vessels uh, have a large uh, proportion of smooth muscle in their media. As we continue down the uh, circulation to the capillaries and then back to the veins, uh, the pressure drops are smaller only because by now three quarters of the pressure has already dropped and so there isn't much additional uh, capacity for further pressure drops. Most arteries have a constant diameter until they bifurcate but the aorta actually tapers, its diameter reducing uh, each time a branch comes off it. And an empirical formula of an exponential function has been used to describe the change in the aortic cross-sectional area as it goes down its length. In this empirical relation, the aortic cross-sectional area A is equal to A0 e to the minus bx over r naught, where a naught is the cross-sectional area of the ascending aorta at the top. r naught is the inner diameter of the ascending aorta at the top. x is the distance along the aorta, which is about 40 centimeter in the dogs. So a naught is about two centimeters squared in a dog. r naught inner is 0.8 centimeters, and B is approximately 0.02 to 0.05. So you could plug in 
x equals 40 centimeters to this relationship to compute what the area is at the other end, distal end of the aorta. Uh, exponential relationships such as these are frequently seen in arterial trees, not just in a single vessel such as the aorta, but actually as a function of branching through the arterial network. Uh, here, for example, we see data from the pulmonary arterial tree of the pig, and the number here represents the vessel order uh, where each number change represents uh, another d level of branching of the vessels. The Strahl order is a number used to define the level of branching of a vascular tree based on uh, diameter ratios. And here we see uh, dimensions on a log scale for five Strahl orders in the pig pulmonary arterial circulation. Now, the number of Strahler orders in a circulation uh, depends on the particular circulation and the species, uh, and there are substantially more than five Strahler orders. You can see that the diameter here is, uh, on a millimeter scale, is about log value of zero, so about one millimeter at order one. Um, but of course, the smallest uh, orders of the uh, vessels are much smaller than that. So there are many more than five Strahler orders in the pulmonary circulation of the pig. In the human, there are about 15 Strahler orders from the pulmonary trunk to the capillaries and about another 15 from the capillaries back to the pulmonary veins. Um, but here we see the largest five in the pulmonary uh, circulation of the pig, and you can see that the diameter and the length decrease exponentially uh, as with each branching order, but that the number, the total number, increases exponentially with a higher exponential rate, with a higher slope. And the result of this is that the total cross-sectional area of the circulation goes up because even though the vessels get exponentially smaller in diameter with each branch and shorter, their number gets exponentially greater at a higher rate so that the total cross-sectional area increases from the pulmonary trunk to the microcirculation and then decreases back from the capillaries to the veins. And consequently, by conservation of mass and continuity equation, the flow mean flow velocity decreases because the flow is constant and the total cross-sectional area is increasing. So hagen poisseur flow has been used to study determinants of the geometry and branching patterns of the arterial tree. And famously, Murray in 1926 performed an analysis of arterial geometry in which he minimized the objective function z, where he defines z to equal the rate at which work is done on the blood plus the metabolic rate of the vessel. So the idea here was that what would be the relationships that would achieve this uh, optimality and would they explain the geometry and branching of vessels. So the rate at which work is done on the blood would be the flow Q dot times delta P. So you'll see this has work per unit time per unit volume. Plus he assumed that the metabolic rate was proportional to the volume of the vessel. So K plus pi A squared L where A is the radius. So then substituting for uh, the pressure gradient from uh, Poisseur's law, we would get that Z is 8 mu L over Q dot squared divided by pi A to the fourth plus K pi A squared L, and minimizing 
this function z uh, by setting its derivative with respect to the radius equal to zero, we would say minus 32 mu l q squared over pi a to the fifth plus 2k pi l a is equal to zero, which we can rearrange uh, in terms of a to get that a to the sixth equals 16 mu q dot squared divided by pi squared k, or in other words, the optimal radius a is proportional to the cubed root of the flow. And in fact, this is consistent with experimental observations on the relationship between flows and radii and vessels. The minimum value of z would therefore be proportional to the square of the uh, radius 3 pi over 2 kla squared. So we can now use this idea to analyze how uh, vessels should branch optimally to preserve this uh, optimal radius. So if we consider this network here, then the total z would be 3 pi k over 2 times a naught squared l plus a1 squared l1 plus a2 squared l2. And by the continuity equation, q1 plus q2 will equal q naught because the total flow is constant. And that would therefore lead us to conclude that a1 cubed plus a2 2 cubed is equal to a naught cubed from this result here. And in fact, that this is what uh, experimental observations have seen, that the ratio of the diameters follows this relationship. Now, actually, we can also derive this relationship a different way. Um, because you might ask the question, well, how does the vessel know how much work it's doing? Or how does the vessel, for that matter, even know what its own diameter is in trying to optimize these relationships as it develops? Well, an alternative way of obtaining the same result is to assume that the wall shear stress remains constant. So as the vessel bifurcates, the flow changes. The flow therefore changes the velocity, which therefore changes the shear rate. However, if the diameter is reduced somewhat, then there would be a point where the wall shear stress would remain constant from the large vessel to the two daughter vessels. And it turns out that that, that ratio of radii follows the same rule as Murray's law. So one possibility is that Murray's law uh, is satisfied by the cells of the lumen of the vessels being able to detect um, shear stress and therefore regulate um, the uh, arteriogenesis and the growth of the vessels according to the shear stress that they sense.